A southeastern Virginia community is stunned by a crime no one can believe. A pregnant woman murdered, her baby lost. Across the state, another town feels a similar shock, a brutal random slaying in a most unexpected setting. Two crimes no one could predict, with no eyewitnesses, few clues, and killers on the run. To solve the crimes, investigators must find the fatal twist. In this program, some of the names have been changed. In Chesapeake, Virginia, on July 6, 2000, Raquel Foley came to the home of her neighbors, Martin and Melissa O'Connell. One of Melissa's co-workers had called Raquel and asked her to check on Melissa, who hadn't come into work that morning and wasn't answering her phone. Still on the line, the co-worker asked Raquel to check a back door. It was unlocked. Melissa's car was in the garage. Okay. Melissa! Melissa! In the kitchen, it looked like a dinner was prepared, but not Is eaten. Still here? No! Okay. Melissa? Melissa was known for being on time every day and was eight months into a difficult pregnancy. Melissa. All right. Now it's locked. Melissa. The bedroom door was locked. Something was wrong. Melissa! On the advice of the coworker, Raquel dialed 911 and reported her concerns to Chesapeake police. Chesapeake officers and EMTs responded immediately. Melissa had developed gestational diabetes during her pregnancy. If she had passed out in the bedroom, she could go into a diabetic coma endangering herself and the baby. They had to get to her. Unlike the rest of the house, the bedroom was in disarray. Then they discovered a body face down in the bathtub. The expectant mother was dead. It was too late to save the baby. Melissa had bruises on her body, and there was some blood on the tub. Officers radioed in the suspicious death. About that time, Melissa's husband, Martin O'Connell, pulled up to the house. He said Melissa's co-worker had called, saying something about an ambulance. An officer asked Martin to wait outside until detectives arrived to speak with him. Homicide detective Tom Downing was on duty that morning. I heard the call uh, coming out uh, on the uh, patrol channel that uh, the investigators were uh, requesting the uh, forensics people to respond. Uh, as well as detectives. With Downing was his partner, Detective Mike Toothman. It is standard procedure for homicide detectives to respond to any suspicious death. Lieutenant, what we got? An officer briefed them on what they knew so far. A dead body, signs of possible ransacking in the bedroom, an unlocked back door, and the woman's husband just informed of the death. Martin O'Connell, was uh, sitting up against the front of the house, uh, adjacent to the garage door, with his head down. He seemed to be uh, very distraught, and I asked him if he would, wouldn't mind coming into uh, the vehicle so Detective Toothman and myself can interview him. Martin told the detectives he had been trying to get in touch with Melissa that morning. He hadn't seen her since the night before. Did this he had indicated he had no idea what had, what had happened to his wife. 
during the interview, we were able to clearly observe a number of abrasions uh, as well as a bandaged finger. When we questioned him about that, he said that he and his wife had had a fight the previous night. Martin said that the night before, he and Melissa help. began arguing. No, you, what you meant is you At one point, me he tried to quiet her by putting his hand up to her mouth. What are you, crazy? You know what? Get out! She was so Get angry, out. she Get bit him on the out. finger, hard. Still finding her sex he said she kicked him out of the house, so he went driving around nearby Virginia Beach. She bit me, I put my hand up. And he told Detective Toothman he tried to get back in touch with Melissa. He had called back to the house on his cell phone and left numerous messages on his uh, digital voice recorder. Uh, during that time, he was saying things about uh, being lost in Virginia Beach, um, Melissa pick up the phone, I'm sorry we fought. According to Martin, after several hours, he came back home, hoping he and Melissa could work things out. But in the garage, he found some of his clothes with a note from Melissa telling him not to come back that night. He switched cars and left. Uh, I'm not really sure. Martin told the detectives that he checked into a local hotel. I had asked him at this point uh, about the abrasions on his arms and elbows and the hands. Martin explained that after checking into the hotel, he went to a local bar and had a few drinks. Okay. And I see that you've got some fresh He said outside the bar, he tripped and fell, cutting his arms. The detectives asked if they could document the injuries. Martin agreed, saying he would do anything to help. The detectives next talked with Raquel Foley, the neighbor who first entered the house, and Cheryl Ramsdell, Melissa's co-worker, to get more information about Melissa. What we learned about Melissa O'Connell during this investigation was that she was just a, a nice person. She uh, you know, did everything right. She was a loving, devoted wife. She couldn't wait to be a, a loving, devoted mother. Everybody that knew her uh, liked her, loved her. And uh, it, was, it was just a, a tragedy that, uh, that she was taken so early. The women believed Melissa and Martin had a strong relationship. They also um, said Melissa was very security conscious, almost paranoid, and always kept the house locked tight. No physical, OK? All right, thank you very much. Investigators hoped the crime scene would provide some answers. Before processing the scene, senior forensics technician Nick Pazillo videotaped everything. The master bedroom was in a complete, total state of disarray. Everything was trashed. Uh, the drawers were dumped out. The rest of the house looked absolutely immaculate, except for this one room. It looked more like a ransacking than signs of a struggle. There was a lack of blood in the area. We didn't notice blood anywhere. Uh, and at that point, we really didn't know what we had. From the toilet, the technicians recovered a partially smoked cigarette. Around the tub, they found several broken candlesticks and a pair of shorts. Also near the tub were the first signs of blood for forensics technician Grover Davis. The water was discolored in the bathtub, and there was a little bit of staining around the bathtub area and the floor area. They collected samples for later study at the crime lab. To the investigators, it looked like a murder. Now they had to find out who would have wanted Melissa O'Connell and her unborn child dead. Police in Chesapeake, Virginia, were investigating the death of Melissa O'Connell, eight months pregnant with her first child. Evidence gathered in the bathroom where the body was found indicated murder. We were thinking that there was a, a good possibility that she may have been placed in the bathtub. Um, after she was killed. The investigators continued checking the rest of the house. Everything seemed normal. They confiscated the answering machine in case it held any clues. 
I surveyed the entire perimeter of the house uh, from the outside and the inside, checking all points of entry, all doors and windows. Uh, found everything to be locked and secured. There was no sign of forced entry with the exception of uh, the back door, which was open. Investigators believed the ransacking was staged. If the person came in to burglarize the house, why didn't they go to other rooms of the house where there were more valuable items than there were in the, in the bedroom? I was very uh, concerned uh, after leaving the crime scene because things just were not were quickly not adding up. They needed more information. As promised, Martin O'Connell, the victim's husband, came to the police station that afternoon for another interview. Detectives were having a hard time eliminating him as a suspect. Family and friends had told police Melissa never allowed smoking in the house, so they believed the killer smoked the cigarette found in the toilet after the murder. We found that Martin O'Connell was uh, a smoker and that he did smoke that brand of cigarette. He again went over his actions on the night in question. The impression that I had was that he was very intent on giving us his alibi. But the detectives noticed that several times some small details of his story changed. They confronted him directly. The interview had started to turn into an interrogation. And at that point, uh, Martin basically shut down. He said he was tired, he wanted to go home. He agreed to meet with me the next morning and finish up the interview. And he also said that he would agree to a polygraph. What really concerned us was uh, the fact that he had never asked how his wife had, had died. He never asked anything about where she was found. Uh, didn't uh, ask any questions about the baby. And uh, this was uh, very significant because, you know, normally so that would be the first thing that somebody would want to uh, know. You know, they would wanna, they'd want to know these things. Perhaps the autopsy would provide more clues. Dr. Leah Bush led the medical team. When I first examined Melissa's body, I was struck by the number of bruises and scratches over her body, which indicated significant blunt force trauma. This woman had been beaten up. It was definitely a murder. Defensive injuries indicated Melissa fought back. She fought for her life. She tried to protect herself and her unborn child from being strangled and beaten to death. They had to prove who killed the mother and unborn child. Detective Downing asked Dr. Bush about Martin O'Connell's bite mark. Martin said he was facing Melissa when he put his hand up to her face. In your opinion. That is far more consistent with somebody having their hand over a person's mouth, trying to muffle their screams or using it as a control mechanism, and then she bit the finger because that on the side because that was the part of the finger close to her, such as this. And when she bit his finger, it wasn't a playful bite. A large piece of flesh was missing. This was somebody who was biting in an attempt to save their life. As each new fact emerged, Martin O'Connell looked more suspicious. But investigators had no solid evidence against him or anyone else. Homicide detectives Mike Toothman and Tom Downing still did not even know exactly where Melissa had been murdered. It had been made to look like a burglary, which we could tell it, it didn't make sense. It wasn't a burglary. Uh, we needed the forensics to tell us exactly what did happen. They secured a search warrant for biological samples. I called his attorney and I told him that I had a search warrant to obtain uh, Martin's DNA, his blood, and some hair samples. Uh, and uh, he, Martin, did meet me here at uh, headquarters, and we had the paramedics uh, draw the blood and, and pull the hair samples. The samples could be useful in later lab examinations. Investigators were trying to put together what really happened on the night Melissa died. Martin claimed Melissa bit his finger during an argument downstairs. 
Martin had told us that the actual fight, the confrontation that they had had the previous evening occurred in the living room. And I even had him show me exactly the spot where they were at the time. After his telling us that, of course, we had the living room luminoled and processed, and there was no evidence of any blood there. Evidence technician Grover Davis began another search of the house, trying to determine where Melissa was attacked. The second trip that we took to the house, we found minute pieces of what we thought were blood or particles of blood on the door, and it led all the way down to the floorboard and the, and the, uh, the uh, rug of the, uh, of the closet. Um, we didn't notice it at first because it was so minute, and the closet itself didn't appear to be touched. It was a major discovery. We ended up sawing out some of the wallboard in the closet area, the, the floor area itself, a uh, piece of carpet from the floor, any area that we felt could contain any blood evidence, or hair, or so on, any bodily fluids. We sent those items to the forensic lab. Police hoped the findings would point them to Melissa's killer. In July of 2000, Chesapeake, Virginia police worked to solve a heartbreaking murder, the beating and strangulation death of Melissa O'Connell, eight months pregnant with a baby girl. The prime suspect was Melissa's husband, Martin O'Connell, who had fresh injuries that he tried to explain away to police. His story seemed unlikely, and police hoped to disprove it with forensic science. At the Eastern Laboratory of the Virginia Division of Forensic Science, DNA examiner B.J. Blankenship compared the DNA from the bloodstain evidence collected at the house to the known DNA profiles of Melissa and Martin O'Connell. On the carpet, the original blood sample that I found uh, matched Melissa's blood. I then went back later and found several other uh, lighter blood stains that one of them matched Martin, and three others were a mixture of blood between Martin and Melissa. When they're mixed together, that means that they were present together at the time the blood was shed. Then the examiner made another important discovery. As I was examining the carpet from the closet, and as I looked down, I noticed something beside the blood stain that was red. So I picked it up with my forceps and looked under the microscope to see what it was, and lo and behold, it was a piece of skin. And you could even see the ridge detail on the skin. The ridge detail meant the skin came from the bottom of a foot, a palm, or a finger. I immediately called the, the police department to ask them if the defendant had any wounds, and he did, in fact, have a wound on his finger. To Dr. Blankenship, it was clear that Martin O'Connell was lying to police and that he was there when his wife was killed. Martin O'Connell told the police the story that the struggle occurred with his wife downstairs. The forensics told us a different story. It said that it happened upstairs in the closet. That's where the original fight occurred. Investigators kept looking for more circumstantial evidence. Melissa's friends had said the couple seemed happy, excited about the baby. But when detectives spoke to Martin's friends, they got a different story. What we had learned is that uh, he really was not planning on being a family man. I mean, that was the far furthest thing from his lifestyle. Detectives also heard unsettling news. Martin had left town. Several friends believed he was now living with relatives in Florida. Martin left the state without submitting to the polygraph examination he promised detectives he would take. Because he had not been charged, 
leaving was not a crime. But it was certainly suspicious. The Chesapeake detectives contacted police in West Palm Beach, Florida, who agreed to set up surveillance at the condo of one of Martin's relatives. Soon, they spotted the suspect. While West Palm Beach could not maintain 24-hour surveillance, they would do regular checks to try to keep an eye on him. In Virginia, detectives were still hoping to figure out the motive for the murder. Then, detectives received a call from a woman in San Diego, California, who said she had an affair with Martin while he was working in the area for a few months that year. When she learned of Melissa's death, she told them she was compelled to call. Based on that information, myself and Detective Toothman went out. We flew out to San Diego and interviewed a young lady. And we had learned a lot about Martin. Um, sometime he was at, May, actually um, in San Diego for an extended period of time, and, uh, and he had met her. But he never told this young lady that, that he was married, and certainly nothing about a, a, a child on the way, a close relationship. Yeah, he told the young woman he wanted her to move to Florida so they could be together. After you found out he was so married, did he tell you at that point, uh, I think that we realized that we had the motive. And please um, give me a call if anything comes to mind. It was time to bring in Martin O'Connell, if they could find him. After several weeks, Chesapeake police were ready to arrest Martin O'Connell for the murder of his pregnant wife. But the suspect had fled to Florida. He had been spotted at a relative's condo in West Palm Beach, but then disappeared. A West Palm Beach deputy tried a ruse to find him. He spoke to the relative about a property damage report Martin had filed with the condo association, saying he needed to talk to Martin about it. The relative said she did not know where Martin was, but would try to have him call. The next day, the deputy received a message from Martin O'Connell with a phone number. He called the number and told Martin he needed his signature on a form about the damage claim. Martin asked him to fax it, but the deputy insisted he needed the original signed. Okay, Mr. He had to have an address. Reluctantly, Martin gave him the address in Clearwater, Florida. The deputy immediately called the Chesapeake detectives and gave them the address. Okay, thank you very much. They, in turn, called police in Clearwater and told them about the case and their arrest warrant. Clearwater PD agreed to attempt the arrest. That's him. Officers set up surveillance at the Clearwater address. It wasn't long before Martin O'Connell showed up and was safely taken into custody and extradited back to Virginia. Prosecutors and detectives worked together to bring this emotional case to trial. In June 2002, a jury agreed on what happened the night of Melissa O'Connell's death. Just weeks before the baby was due, the couple had an argument. In Melissa's walk-in closet, Martin attacked. When he tried to stifle her screams, she bit him, fighting for her life. But he was too strong. Martin O'Connell was found guilty of murder and sentenced to life in prison without the possibility of parole. At the time, Virginia law made it impossible to charge him with killing his unborn daughter, too. But because of this case, that has changed. The city of Chesapeake was shaken to the core by the brutal crime. 300 miles to the west, another Virginia town was in for a similar shock. On the afternoon of October 11, 1990, Roanoke police officers Michael Warner and Tom Kincaid were preparing for their shift when a man pulled up in a rush. 
Yes, sir. He exited the car and he was very nervous and he told us that uh, there had been a woman that had been killed in a, a basement at uh, Subdivision just up the street. Uh, at that time, we kind of wondered if it was for real. We asked him, or was he kidding us or, or joking with us? It was no joke. The officers asked where the house was. And he said that he could take us there if we'd follow him. So we went ahead and followed him up to the house. Officers called in the report of a possible dead body. At the house, two women were waiting. They said they were local realtors. The woman inside was a co-worker. She was in the basement, dead. The officers had to clear the house to make sure no one dangerous was inside. In the kitchen, they found a realtor's notebook and business card. They headed to the basement. In a large pool of blood lay a body. Uh, we were pretty confident looking at the victim that she was deceased and there was no uh, immediate first aid that we could give her. The officers called for detectives and crime scene technicians. Outside, the okay. other realtors said the dead woman was named Carolyn Rogers. The co-workers had come to the house looking for Carolyn when she didn't show up for lunch and found the body. None of them had seen anyone leaving the house. Roanoke County Police forensic evidence technicians soon arrived. It was up to them and the medical examiner to find the clues left behind and determine what happened inside the house. Also responding were county detectives. They would try to use those clues to find whoever was responsible. The patrol officers briefed the others on the apparent homicide. Um, what we have inside is down in the basement, we have a uh, white female gentleman here is found behind me. I've interviewed him. Got Detective statement. Phil Patrone knew the evidence search was critical. Um, that's kind of where we're at right now. We had no eyewitnesses that we were able to determine immediately. We had just the victim in the basement. Forensic evidence technician Rick Moorer helped process the basement. We carefully went through the scene. We began to photograph it using a 35 millimeter camera. And uh, documenting it through sketches and so forth. Medical examiner William Masello checked the body. This was uh, a middle-aged woman that was uh, lying face down, and there was a, a large pool of blood around her. Very obviously, she had uh, sustained some sort of an injury which had resulted in bleeding, be it a gunshot wound, stab wound at all. I didn't really know what it was until I got into uh, further examining the body. Body temperature indicated the woman had been dead for several hours. Here. The most obvious clues were the bloody shoe prints. Preserving them was crucial for forensic scientist supervisor Michael Grimm. At the scene, we took photographs of footwear impressions. And included in the photographs were scales to assure proper enlargement of the impressions once they were returned to the lab. A number of the impressions appeared to have been made by a female shoe based on the shape and size. In addition to that, there were footwear impressions that appeared to have been made by a much larger shoe, one with a large heel and a large sole area. The technician searched for any other clues. I discovered a, a small button that was laying in the blood. Uh, I felt that that was very important. That button did not match any of the buttons that Mrs. Rogers had on. 
So uh, we we're very c careful to collect that. The evidence suggested to police that this was definitely a murder. Investigators then looked to determine their first lead. There were no vehicles at the house. She was a realtor, and if she had to get there somehow, so we assumed then at least that the car was stolen. contacted Carolyn's family. They learned details about her car and put out an all points bulletin for it. Lieutenant Warner was part of the force out looking for the car. I started concentrating my efforts on large parking lots, motel rooms and stuff like that in the area. And approximately 9, 30, 10 o'clock that evening, I was at the mall and I happened to spot the vehicle. Uh, once I did, I laid back and watched it just for a few minutes. I noticed that there's nobody hanging around it. Dispatch, I'm gonna be out on John Lincoln Charles 7865. Warner called in the discovery and did a cursory check of the vehicle. The door was locked. But inside, he could see a legal pad. looked like it had blood spots on it. If so, it could help lead to the killers. Investigators sent the pad to the crime lab for immediate analysis. Roanoke Police Chief Ray Lavender looked for other clues. We immediately notified security at uh, the mall uh, where the car was located that uh, if any other evidence or suspicious activity occurred in the area, we would like to know about it immediately. Any articles of clothing uh, that might indicate a person had changed clothing, anything at all like that. Next morning, they got a call back. Some of the maintenance personnel at the mall had located a pair of shoes and had thrown those shoes into a dumpster. We immediately went to that dumpster. We located the shoes. They had uh, small heels uh, similar to the type of shoes that may have walked through the blood at the crime scene. We labeled them uh, and uh, tagged them and immediately took them uh, as evidence and later submitted them to the lab. The investigators tried to work quickly Whoever committed such a senseless and vicious crime had to be stopped fast. Roanoke, Virginia police believed two people were involved in the brutal slaying of realtor Carolyn Rogers. Technicians found two sets of bloody shoe prints at the scene and collected a legal pad with possible bloodstains from the victim's car. Yet investigators had no idea who the suspects were or where they went. They hoped more information would turn up at the autopsy. Assistant Chief Medical Examiner William Masello led the post-mortem examination. Cause of death in this uh, individual was a stab wound to the chest going right, right through the heart and the left lung. At the edge of the fatal wound, the doctor noted scalloped markings. And uh, these were very suggestive of a uh, stake-type knife or a knife with a serrated blade. The doctor also discovered a distinctive pattern of bruises on the back of the head. So this is the type of the thing you, can, you might see when some sort of an object uh, strikes the head. The wounds were photographed for comparison in case a weapon was found. The victim's family had said she always wore nice jewelry, yet none remained on the body. Bruises indicated someone had forcibly removed her ring and earrings. Got this from the bank. Though still shocked and grieving, Carolyn's husband did what he could to help. Are those the three checks here at the bottom? He had reviewed the couple's bank accounts and discovered a check cashed the day of the murder. Marcia J. Smith, 
$500 for house cleaning services. We don't have a house cleaning service detective. He told Detective Phil Patrone it was a forgery. Our checks. Made out to a person that Mr. Rogers didn't know. In fact, Mr. Rogers made it very clear to us that they didn't have a house cleaning service. A detective went to the bank and spoke to the manager there. The manager had saved the canceled check, made out to a Marsha J. Smith. At the Virginia Division of Forensic Science, examiners did the processing. To develop any unseen fingerprints, the forged check was sprayed with ninhydrin aerosol. Ninhydrin reacts to secretions from human skin that transfer easily to porous surfaces. The legal pad found in the victim's car was also processed. Forensic scientist Michael Grimm introduced heat and steam from a household iron to cause the reaction. <clears throat> Several partial fingerprints were revealed. He then turned to the legal pad. During that examination, a fingerprint was developed in the lower right-hand corner on the front page of the notepad. This fingerprint was photographed and subsequently entered into Virginia's automated fingerprint identification system, also known as APHIS. Within a matter of minutes, a potential hit was returned uh, to the laboratory. It was for a woman named Wendy Horst. Detective Patron called in the hit. An address was found for Marcia Smith, whose name appeared on the forged check. Detectives traveled to Blacksburg, Virginia, to interview her. Wendy Horst. Do you know anything about her? Marcia did know Wendy Horst. She used to work with her. And Marcia had recently lost Actually, her license. You know, my, my driver's license. I appreciate you taking it was all around the same time Horst left town. Detectives believed Horst stole the license, then used it to cash the forged check. Thank you. Detective Kern soon received a background check on Wendy Horst. She was the girlfriend of a known violent offender named Danny King. Danny was pretty much a career criminal. He had been involved in a number of crimes, a number of violent crimes. He had just gotten out of uh, prison. He'd been out of prison 10 days when this offense occurred. Danny, uh, just absolutely uh, a ruthless uh, criminal. Roanoke police went to King's last known address and yeah. spoke with a relative there. Yes, I am. She was a very cooperative person. She was very uh, sorry for the uh, reasons that we were there. The woman yes, said Wendy uh, Horst had lived with her yes. until Danny got out of prison recently. You saw him, what were they doing? She had observed a license plate taken off the female accomplice's vehicle, put onto a van that uh, Danny and his accomplice had just driven in with one day. Uh, on the 11th. The day after the Rogers murder, the couple left town. And they were in a rush to leave. Investigators did not know where the pair had gone, but now they had a license plate number. They entered the plate, as well as descriptions of the van and the two suspects, into the National Crime Information Center's computer system and put out a nationwide teletype requesting law enforcement agencies across the country to look out for the couple. The chances were slim. The couple could be anywhere. Then, on October 15th, just four days after the murder, a state trooper on patrol in New Philadelphia, Ohio, spotted a van at a rest area. November Charlie, 7406. 
on a gold He called in the plates caravan. and learned the van was possibly connected to a murder in Virginia. 518, if you send me a 10 The trooper called for backup. Back Two brutal killers might be inside. Four days after realtor Carolyn Rogers was murdered in Roanoke, Virginia, police 350 miles northwest in New Philadelphia, Ohio, spotted the van associated with the two suspects. As soon as other state troopers arrived as backup, they moved in. Stick your hands out the window. Driver, get your hands out the window. Hands out the window. In the passenger seat was Wendy Horst. Come out of the car nice and easy and face forward. The driver was Danny King. The two were taken into custody without a struggle. She ain't got nothing to do with this. She ain't got nothing to do with this. In their preliminary search of the van, Ohio troopers noticed a key ring with the logo of the victim's real estate company. They also spotted a knife, a knife. with a serrated blade. Okay. Ohio authorities contacted Roanoke Police Chief Ray Lavender. I had uh, received word from the Ohio Highway Patrol that they had located uh, uh, Danny King and his accomplice. I got the first flight out of Roanoke, which was about 4 a.m. the next morning. After getting a warrant, the Roanoke police conducted a full search of the suspect's van. They found some clothing, both male and female, that appeared to have blood on it. One piece caught their attention. We also located a work shirt uh, with a missing button. And the reason that was important to us is that we had found a button at the crime scene. And the buttons on that shirt were identical to those we found at the crime scene. Uh, we also recovered a pair of boots that we believe belonged to Mr. King. We were particularly interested in those. Their soles would be compared to the bloody crime scene shoe prints. The tread pattern looks very familiar. Investigators also collected the knife Ohio troopers had spotted. After collecting the evidence, the detectives went to interview Wendy Horse. She admitted to forging the check and pawning the ring. She said that she was present at the house at the time of the murder, but swore she did not see it actually happen. She said that she really didn't know what happened, uh, that uh, Mr. King was in the basement with a real estate agent, and he came out of the basement, ordered her to get in the car and drive uh, to the local mall. As the interview continued in Ohio, examiners in Virginia processed two more forged checks that had been recovered. Prints were lifted from the new checks and compared to King's known prints. Those fingerprints were positively identified as fingerprints of Danny King. That's it, that's it, it's a match. It was time to interview King. No, 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 King denied having anything to do with the murder. He didn't find my fingerprints. There would be no confession. Well, I'm just to prove you, what happened, investigators you. turned to forensic evidence. So maybe they're wrong. Michael Grimm checked the shoe prints photographed at the scene against the recovered shoes. The examiner reported a strong association between the high heels and the smaller crime scene prints. And a positive match between the boots and the larger prints. Next, he checked the reproductions and inked impressions of the suspect's feet against the wear on the inside of the shoes. 
he reported similar findings. Horst could not be eliminated as the primary wearer of the heels, and Danny King was an exact match with the boots. It is our opinion that these characteristics are unique to that shoe. The lab findings were exactly what Commonwealth's attorney Randy Leach needed for trial. It would have been a very difficult case to prosecute without the forensic evidence. In June 1991, the prosecutor used the forensic evidence to prove to a jury what happened to Carolyn Rogers. She can't meet us at like 10 in the morning. Okay. Cool. Okay. Don't use your name. Danny King had his girlfriend call some realtors, allegedly to look at a house. See if she can meet us early as time. Carolyn Rogers had the misfortune to take the call. Look at one of your houses on Jefferson Street. Yes, the morning would be best. Okay, thank you very much. Bye. Cool. So meet us. Pure and simple, the motive behind the crime was robbery. Okay, come on in. Uh, Danny King had been in the penitentiary for a number of years and had been out for 10 days. He had no income. And the crime was committed to get Carolyn Rogers jewelry, her checkbook, any cash she might have had so they would have money to go out of state on a honeymoon trip. It's not finished, but you could have actually, uh, you can make this into two or three bedrooms or a big family room for children. As when they got to the basement, King's girlfriend decided to go outside for a cigarette. Yeah. I'm going to go have a cigarette. Leaving Danny uh, King alone with Carolyn. My name is Jill. Danny King was a dangerous man. He didn't care who he had to hurt to get what he wanted. He killed her and robbed her. They parked the victim's car at a local mall where Danny wiped it down to get rid of any fingerprints. He made his girlfriend leave her shoes. He thought he had erased any trace of their passage, any connection between them and the murder. But the Roanoke investigators and lab examiners found all the evidence they needed. You know Fingerprints, shoe prints, even a shirt button. We were able to show the jury that not only had he stabbed her, and not only did she die a horrible death there, but that she had been stomped in the head with his boot. That went a long way toward convicting Danny King and, and the ultimate punishment being imposed. The jury found Danny King guilty of forgery, robbery, and murder and recommended the death penalty. He was executed on July 23rd, 1998. His accomplice was convicted of accessory after the fact and received five years. She has since been released. Many homicide victims place themselves in dangerous situations. When the purely innocent are taken, Police and forensic examiners work especially hard to find answers in the fatal twist.